So we are starting our fourth uh, special topic. And as I discussed at the end of the last lecture, uh, the purpose here is to somehow abandon one level of phenomenological approach uh, where on the macroscopic level, we have a formulation, it's a theoretical result, but there are some constants, and these constants come from experimentation. Uh, so let's say not phenomenological, but rather uh, experimental approach, and see if we can go to another level uh, of modeling where we can actually predict these constants. And at that level, we will also need some phenomenological or experimental input, but at least uh, it's, it's an approach where uh, we're, we're on the on the upper lever that we were at before. Uh, we are actually, let me say, um, experiment free in some sense. So that's that's quite interesting, and we'll see how that comes about. And the topic is atomic to continuum scale transition. So eventually, uh, we will have some atomic level model that feeds information to the continuum model that we have uh, discussed before, specifically in the context of linear or nonlinear elasticity. Um, and although the continuum part is the focus of this course, um, the, the tools that we have, mathematical tools that we have um, developed, and the concepts that we are familiar with so far will help us also address this part in a somewhat smoother manner as well. So uh, let's begin by discussing something that is called the um, pair potential. So what one typically is interested in in physics or chemistry is the total energy of an ensemble of atoms. Okay, so an atom is composed of, well, I'm going to draw them like this, but really uh, I should perhaps draw only dots. You may not be able to see them, so I'm just drawing circles here. They indicate um, nuclei, okay? So there's a certain point associated with the position of the nuclei. Let's say this is our uh, origin or observer. And this is my ith nucleus. And the position vector of that nucleus would be indicated with Ri. Um, now, the reason one sometimes puts like this halo of, let's say, circle or sphere around the nucleus position is because there's going to be eventually some uh, electron density floating around the nucleus, and so it forms sort of a uh, structure around it, not necessarily symmetric like this, but this is just to sort of indicate that when I talk about an at atom, it's not the nucleus only, but in addition, the electrons that are associated with it. Okay, um, so we have n atoms here. And they are composed of the nuclei plus the electrons. And that's the case for um, every um, atom, okay? And then we could be talking about the total energy of the system. Um, and the total energy of the system would be, so when I say the total energy, right? So we understand what we normally understand from a roughly a classical system. So there's going to be some kinetic energy and there's going to be some potential energy. So, um, well, in the context of such an atomic setup, right, where we have nuclei and there is electrons floating around it. Um, so when you talk about the energy, the concept comes from 
physics or chemistry. So it comes from, uh, if you like, quantum chemistry or quantum physics. Um, so, but in the end, uh, there is going to be a kinetic energy. And first of all, you have the kinetic energy associated with the electrons because they are floating around. And eventually, there is the kinetic energy associated with the nuclei because the nuclei can also move. They can vibrate where they are. Okay. Um, well, of course, the electrons interact with each other. These are like charged particles. And likewise, the electrons interact with each other. They are also liked, like charged particles. And also, the electrons interact with the nuclei. Okay. Okay, so these are the overall the kinetic and potential energy contributions, right? So let me make a note. This is the kinetic energy of electrons. This is the kinetic energy of nuclei. This here is the electron-electron interaction. This is the electron-nucleus interaction. And finally, the nucleus-nucleus interaction. Okay. And these three interactions are inherently described by something you already know, the Coulomb law. You know, the Coulomb potential, which states that if you have, so the potential of Coulomb is, right, if you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, then the potential associated with it is proportional to the product of the charges and the distance between the two charges. Okay, so R12 is the distance between the two, two charges, and Q indicates the charge itself. Okay. Now, the whole thing, as I said, eventually, to be precise, is described by quantum mechanics. And in order to, well, the quantum mechanics uh, description is based on in most cases the Schrodinger equation. So that's what you would have to solve. And um, then you would feed that information or the information that you extract from this solution would be fed into each of these terms for the purpose of their calculation. Now, why would you need to solve that in order to have that description complete so that you can find out what the total energy is? The answer is simple. So first of all, if you look at every one of these terms, the kinetic energy of the nuclei actually typically has a classical expression. Um, but it doesn't matter what it is because what we will assume, and that's a typical assumption, is that when you change the position of the nuclei, we will assume that the electrons will be able, able to so rapidly conform to the new configuration of the nuclei that, in essence, their response to the nucleus position is instantaneous. Okay? That's what we are going to assume. All right? uh, and that's a typical assumption okay? in most cases, in some cases, let's say. Right. So then we are additionally going to assume that the kinetic energy of the nuclei is negligible. Let's say they're not vibrating because, let's say, the temperature is so low, whatever. Okay. So we are going to oops, omit that term. Okay. Okay. Let's say we do zero Kelvin. Okay. That's sometimes what people say. Uh, let's say we do zero Kelvin. Looks like okay, right? Zero Kelvin. Okay. Um, so then we have to describe the remaining uh, terms. Well, all right. Now these terms are um, 
obeying this type of a potential, but there is a problem. The electron, so for instance, when we look at, look at the nuclei, where the nuclei are at distinct positions, I know where they are, I know what their charges are, and so I can immediately evaluate that potential. But that's not the case when you talk about an electron nucleus interaction because the electron at any given time is not at any one place. You talk about not its place, but rather its probability of being at a certain location implicitly. And therefore, this type of a description does not really hold through the charge of the electron, but rather through the density of the electron at a given point, okay? And that so-called density, which might be higher in certain regions, much less, let's say, away from where the atoms are, is described by what is called the wave function, and the wave function is the solution of that equation. Now, so you need to solve this to evaluate at least these terms, and eventually, this term similarly requires a wave function because it's very similar to one half uh, mass times velocity squared, the vex expression for the kinetic energy, but instead of the velocity, because you don't have a well-defined position, you don't have a well-defined velocity at a position with a certain direction, instead what you make use of is the gradient of the wave function. So the wave function is also fed in there, and it's used to calculate the kinetic energy. So suppose you are a quantum physicist, you can solve it, and for a given configuration of these atoms, you can find the total energy. All right, good, okay, but that's not what, what we are, okay? So what we want to do is we want to somehow simplify that, that description for the purposes of our goal, which is this, right? Um, so now, to make that simplification, right, so that we don't have to, at least at this stage, deal with this complexity, let's have a look at the expression of the total energy as a general functional, okay? So I have the total energy of the system, uh, and the total energy is clearly parametrized by the positions of the nuclei, okay? So because the electrons conform, their distribution conform, to the position of the nuclei, so the energy will change only if I change the position of the nuclei. So these are the n positions of the n nuclei. So then what one can do is, uh, it turns out, is, is an expansion of this energy in terms of the positions of the nuclei. So first of all, you can, it's like almost like a Taylor series expansion, right? Uh, first, you can, of course, always have a constant, okay? And then terms that are terms where the positions appear by themselves. And I'll try to interpret these terms. Okay. okay. So even if there are no atoms, you can define a reference energy. That's your reference energy. And then you think that perhaps there is some external source, there is a physical reason as to why every time you add one atom at a certain location, it makes a distinct contribution to your overall energy. Because perhaps there's some huge charge somewhere else or some field, electric field, that your nucleus will interact with and its positioning within your system when you add that nucleus, will make a contribution. Let's say that is such a contribution, right? Uh, now, however, suppose you add the first atom, nucleus. When you add the second nucleus, the second nucleus will make such a contribution, but now it will start to interact with the first nucleus that you have added. And when you add the third one, it will not only make a contribution, but will interact with the first two. So I need to add such terms in there. Okay. So the interaction is for every atom with every other atom. So J should not be equal to I when I take interactions into account. And notice that there is a one half here because I need to count every pair only once. If this is three and this is five, that's a one count. But if this is five and that's three, that's the same pair still, so I better divide by two so that I take that into account. So 
Let's call that another function that takes care of such an interaction. Okay. Um, and so on. Okay. So this one avoids counting twice. Okay. Good. So clearly, I could add a function e tilde 3 in terms of three uh, coordinates, r, i, r, j, r, k, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to make a comment on that as well shortly. So uh, let's summarize here what we have. E0 is a reference energy. Um, E1 is the interaction. let's say, with an external source. E2 is what we're going to call a, eventually a pair potential because it's a term that depends only pairs of nuclei, right? And when I talk about Ek, where k is greater than or equal to 3, we talk about many body potentials. Question, yes. Does it have to go all the way to EM? Um, in principle, yes. In principle, yes. Right. Oops. I think that's where the cutoff is. Okay? But we're not going to go all the way there. In fact, we're going to cut off here. Okay, so now, that's a constant, right? So we're going to omit this. This one is important because it's a non-trivial contribution, but for our purposes, it's easy to deal with, okay? It has a trivial dependence on the positions of the nuclei. So it turns out, again, for our purposes, easy to incorporate if necessary, so we are going to omit it. Okay. All right. um, now, this one, what does this mean? Well, it means the following. Suppose I throw in atom, let's say, A. Okay. So I throw in atom A into the system, it makes a contribution. Then I add an atom B. When I add atom B, it makes a contribution, plus it starts interacting with atom B, all right? Um, and let's say there's a certain force that forms between atom A and B, okay? So A, let's say, repels B with a certain force. There might be other atoms here which repel B, but A certainly repels B with a certain uh, force, all right? And, uh, Imagining that there are only two atoms presently, okay, that repulsion is an effective repulsion. It's not only due to nucleus-nucleus interaction. It's a result of everything that goes into the system, the nuclei and the electrons, all right? Uh, so now that, in the end, will cause a certain energy contribution. It's that contribution, okay? So now what we think of as the last term representing is in some sense the following. I throw in now a third atom C and when I make this atom approach A and B, I notice that the interaction force between A and B starts to change. Well, if the energy contribution was only up to here, okay, 
that would certainly be sufficient, but I noticed that this must not be a complete description of the system because if it were, the interaction energy between A and B should not really depend on whether or not there is an atom C. But I find out that it does, and therefore there must be some other term here that depends on the positions of the nuclei. Okay? Uh, on terms that where more than three nuclei appear. Okay? Three or more nuclei appear. Okay? So that would be my interpretation of what many body potentials do. And in reality, that's the case. Okay? So this is not something we can easily omit. But we need to make or fall back to some reasonable level of approximation. And a very good start is to cut off here. Okay? So these we are not going to really omit because they are trivial, but we're going to neglect them. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it is an approximation. Okay. So for us, perhaps that would be a sufficient starting point, and therefore, E2 term is the only thing that we will deal with, and it will demonstrate some of the complexities that one faces when one tries to extract some continuum, or let me say macroscopic level, macroscopic as to the microscopic one, which in this case, atomic. When one tries to extract macroscopic level information, one encounters difficulties that we can demonstrate through E2 already. Okay. So therefore, let's concentrate on the pair potential. What we are going to propose is a, therefore, an expression for the total energy. In terms of the E2 term. Uh, and therefore, it's useful to analyze um, how that term should physically be, behave. What is our expectation from such a function or functional? Right? And this is where actually something that I partially referred to earlier comes in very nicely. It's one application of what is called observer invariance uh, or objectivity. And I'm going to, um, with this, transition also demonstrate that not rigorously, but by arguing, which I think you will also expect, um, accept. Right? So now the first argument is that suppose I have two atoms and there's a certain interaction, pair interaction between them. Now because it's a pair interaction, if I take these atoms and I move them here, the interaction shouldn't change. If I move them there as well, it shouldn't change. And if I move them away from the board, it shouldn't change. Okay? Now, that argument rigorously leads to the expression that, okay, and let's call that translational invariance. So the energy, the pair interaction is invariant, does not depend on the translational motion of the pair. Uh, so that leads to the restriction that when you try to write such a expression, it should not depend on explicitly these two coordinates, but rather on the distance between the two nuclei. Okay. Okay. So now I've made this transition, this simplification. Instead of two expressions, you see the difference between them. Okay. And let us call this a term um, R, I, J. It is the distance of or the position, relative position of J with respect to I, okay? Just be careful with the ordering. This is my definition, right? J, I, I, J, okay? So it's a vector that points from I to J, if you like. All right, now, but that's not all. What else can I do? What else can I argue? I can rotate it, right. I can take this pair, I, can, I translate it doesn't change the interaction, right? But if I rotate them, I also don't expect any change, all right? And that's called rotational invariance. And from rotational invariance, what do we conclude then? Do you think? <laughs> 
All right, so um, from translational invariance, uh, what we conclude is that what matters is the relative position of J with respect to I. So from rotational invariance, I'm going to conclude that E2 is a function of What does that mean? But any rotation doesn't change it. So in other words, if I throw in Rij or any rotation of it, so Qrij, it doesn't matter. So therefore, E2 is possibly a function of the magnitude of Rij. And so let's put it this way. And let us call that simply Rij, right? So we could do this more rigorously uh, as a actually nice exercise in invariance, but um, I think this sort of argument is sufficient. Now, let us just call such a function phi tilde, okay? So that's some special functional form where instead of R i and R j, I have only the distance between them appearing. So just to simplify things, I called it phi tilde. And that is just for one pair. So for the whole setup, if I omit, make the, follow the assumptions that I made, made, I can now approximate the overall um, energy of the atomic ensemble that I'm talking about through the pair interactions, i equals 1 to n, j equals 1 to n, but j should not be equal to i of the pair interactions. Okay. Good. So, so far, um, you know, what we've done is we've We've discussed the physics, we've discussed the difficulty behind the physics, and so to simplify it, we carried out some mathematical expression for the total energy, and then we've simplified it, okay? So this is our sort of way of thinking about this problem, right? Uh, now the question obviously is, what is phi tilde? I don't know what it is, right? Uh, now, no matter what I pick phi tilde to be, we should realize that I can never describe E exactly uh, unless I have a very, very simple scenario because I have made some assumptions, right? Uh, but nevertheless, if I pick it cleverly, then I might be able to uh, obtain some acceptable level of approximation to the total energy that I'm trying to find out, right? So for that purpose, I need some input from, let's say, some exact numerical calculations of the original setup or some theoretical observation or some experimental observation. So no matter how you look at it, the observation is the following. So what you can do is you can look at the um, overall energy of, let's say, a pair of atoms. And I'm just going to write here E instead of phi tilde, although I'm really assuming two atoms. Okay, so that's I, that's J, that's Rij, okay? Okay, or if you like, that's just simply R. That's R, right? Um, and Let's say my reference energy is zero. Um, I can pick it to be anything. I picked it to be zero, which means that the, if the atoms are far, far, far away from each other, well, actually, let me be careful here. Even if the atoms are far, far, far away from each other, um, they have their own energies by themselves because they have some electron cloud around them. So what I'm doing is, if they are very far, far away, then they have some energy, and I'm always offsetting my total energy by that reference energy. So that if they are very far away, I'm thinking that the energy goes to zero. So I'm going to start off from here, okay? And then 
eventually turns out, if I make them approach to each other, what one observes is that the energy goes down to a certain level, and then it rapidly rises, okay? So this now is my observation. Um, and the observation is that there is a certain location where the energy becomes a minimum. Let's call that epsilon. Uh, there is a distance, reference distance, where the energy becomes a minimum. Let's call that R0, and that is the equilibrium position, as you will remember from your undergraduate physics. Um, there is a certain region where the energy crosses, a certain point where the energy crosses zero. Let's call that point sigma. Sigma is the value of R at which the energy crosses zero, again, okay? It goes to zero there, but when they're too, too close, then again it crosses zero. Um, and that's pretty much it. And what we know is that if the atoms are very, very close to each other, they strongly repel each other, strong repulsion. And if they're very far away, there is a attraction between them, but it's weak. And the force has to do with the slope. That's why this is very strong, because the slope is very steep, and this is weak because the slope is very small, right? So, weak attraction. Now, this is a rigorous observation, okay? Um, and um, in, in, again, in most cases, it looks like this. And therefore, what we aim to do now is somehow find a function phi tilde that looks like this. Okay? It will have a certain minimum, position, equilibrium position R0, crosses at sigma, and when they're too close, repulsion should be very strong. When they're far away, the attraction should be weak. Okay? So now let's try to write such a uh, function. Right. All right. Um, well, the, there isn't one function, of course. There are many functions. And the function that I will write down is one of the famous ones, most widely, not necessarily the accurate one. It's just one among many. But it's one of the, let's say, basic ones. Okay? And it's called the Leonard-Jones potential. And again, as I said, its purpose or its nature is to capture the essential observations regarding the overall energy change in a uh, two-atom system, okay? Essential observations. And the Leonard-Jones potential reads as follows. You say phi tilde is a function of the distance between the pair for epsilon, right? Epsilon, remember, is the minimum value that it will take. Um, sigma is where it crosses zero. like this. And here, the first term is a term that has a higher exponent. The higher exponent eventually, when r is small enough, is the one that is responsible for this very steep rise. So this term has to do with strong repulsion. And the one with a smaller exponent is, and with a minus sign, is responsible for the weak attraction. Okay. And that weak attraction functionally is uh, motivated by what you will remember as the Van der Waals um, 
interaction from, again, your under, undergraduate uh, physics. So it has such a exponent, and the exponent is 6. All right. So, um, well, does it work? It works if sigma is equal to r, it's equal to 0. Okay. Um, you can take it, somehow play with it, find with its derivative, set, set the derivative to, to 0, and find that the equilibrium position is r0 in terms of uh, the other values. Um, and the minimum will occur at epsilon. All right. Um, OK, now before I move on, um, let's see how um, this is going to work out. If I have a chance, I'll show you the video as well. But um, so whenever I see Leonard Jones, I just always remember a joke that some famous comedian made some long time ago. So does anyone know Leonard Jones? OK, OK. So, do you think it's two people or one person? <laughs> it's, you, you never know, right? I mean, because before we talked about Piola Kirchhoff. I mean, okay, that's sort of suggestive because Piolo is very Italian and the other guy, well, you can't think it's German or Russian, you don't know. So, uh, but, but, you know, still might be one person, we don't know their parents, but uh, it turns out they're two different people, Piola Kirchhoff, right? But we wrote it in the same way, Piola Kirchhoff. So Leonard Jones is actually uh, one person, he's one uh, English mathematician, right? But so, when I was a kid, uh, so there was a, there was a uh, program on TV. Uh, it was a classical music uh, program. And uh, this program was uh, prepared by a, a conductor, Turkish conductor, Hitmek Şimşek. And uh, so he, he, the purpose was, I guess, to, uh, to, to, to sort of uh, make uh, grown-ups and kids alike like classical music more. And so uh, in that program, which was broadcast on Sundays, we would watch it as a family. And sometimes um, we would, uh, he, would, he would show once in a while, repeatedly actually, show videos by this British comedian, Danny Kay. Okay? You may or may not have heard of him. So uh, Danny Kay, uh, not British, American comedian. So he's, he's, in a, um, he's in a sort of a mock-up concert, uh, mock-up in the sense that he's not a conductor but he goes ahead and tries to conduct the New York Philharmonic. And uh, so he does jokes, etc. And at some point he says, well, um, so now we will play you a, a famous piece, The Flight of the Bumblebee, by two famous British composers, Rimsky and Korsakov. So and then people laugh because Rimsky and Korsakov are not two people and they're not British. So it's one Russian composer. Okay, so I always, for some reason, whenever I see Leonard Jones, I remember that joke. I, I always like it. So now, <laughs> that's the joke, right? Um, that, that, that's what it reminds me. Now, if it works out, if it doesn't, we're going to cut off. But I want to show you that video because I find it somehow hilarious. Maybe it's because it reminds me of my uh, childhood days. We will do now the flight of the bumblebee by those two very British composers, Ripsky and Korsakov. <laughs> the flight of the bumblebee. So, okay, I'll skip this part a little bit. This is very short, so we're going to listen to it.
the actually fun part, which is now <laughs> to deal with this potential, the Leonard Jones potential. And now you will always remember the bumblebee. OK. Um, right. OK. So we have the total energy description. It's an approximation, but one that is, uh, let me say, quali qualitatively reasonable to some extent. Anyway, again, a approximation or a model for this pair interaction that is also reasonable to a certain extent. So now, once you have those two pieces, uh, you have also now a description of the force. Let's call that F, that's a vector. Um, that acts on atom I, okay, due to the presence of atom J. So, on I due to J. Okay, and that is, of course, some um, function of the vector Rij, okay? Again, there is translational invariance, but this time, the rotational invariance is implicit there, but eventually, if you think not in a straightforward way, in other words, it doesn't depend on the distance, but if you rotate the orientation, then the force somehow should rotate appropriately. So there is some sort of invariance argument there as well, but we don't really need to worry about it because it will come out automatically from the form of phi tilde when I plug it in into this expression. Okay, so that is an expression that you know from your, again, undergraduate physics. Okay, so uh, the derivative of the potential with respect to the explicit position of the ith nucleus uh, or atom in the sense because we don't have any more electrons. All the information is lumped into this phi tilde. So uh, nevertheless, let's say nucleus, and there's a minus sign indicating that the force resists this change. Okay? Um, now, because Rij is Rj minus Ri, I can equivalently express that force as such, but now without the minus sign because this is Rj minus Ri, so the R minus goes in there if you like. Um, so, well, how do I calculate that derivative? Because phi tilde depends on the distance only, so what you would have to do is first take a derivative with respect to the distance, and then take the derivative of the distance with respect to the vector Rij, okay? So eventually, once I complete that calculation, of course, the result is such that the force on I due to J is minus the force on J due to I. So that interaction is going to be equal and opposite. All right. Um, so now, there are two terms here. First of all, um, the first term, let's call it phi prime. And likewise, the second derivative I will call phi double prime, uh, and I will write down the expression for that. You know the function expression for phi, so that's straightforward. You can verify it yourself after, after I write this. Uh, now, this one is eventually equal to Rij over Rij, vector over distance. In other words, this is a unit vector. It's the normalized version of the vector Rij. It's a unit vector that points from I to J. And let me just remind you why that is. I'll just put down the uh, calculation as a note. Suppose we are, in general, looking at the derivative of any magnitude of a vector, magnitude of any vector with respect to the vector itself. Okay. Uh, so that would be del uh, vii I over del vj ej, okay? So that's our standard gradient. It's, it's any scalar with respect to the vector v, and that's how the uh, derivative is expressed, all right? So now when I take the derivative, it's going to be 1 half. This term now goes over here. And that's nothing but the magnitude of V, 
Now I'm going to switch the indices because I is something I need and I don't want it appearing three times. If you like here, you can immediately write the magnitude of V. I'm going to write presently VKK. Okay, just to highlight that sometimes you need to be careful with the indices. Um, so then what you have left is the derivative of what's inside the square root with respect to uh, Vj, Ej. Okay? And this here is two times Vi delta Ij. Okay? And now this would, delta Ij would make this one an Ei, so that would be, okay, so the twos cancel, one over the magnitude of V, and here all you see is V itself, okay, and hence this result. Okay. So that's one comment, and the other comment is regarding the phi tilde, sorry, phi prime, and phi double prime. So phi prime, go ahead, calculate it yourself. Directly from the Leonard-Jones potential. That's the first derivative. And we don't see the second derivative yet, but we will need it, so I'm writing it down. It's 24 epsilon over r squared. So it's going to be the derivative of that, right? So first I take the derivative of this, so it's 24 epsilon r squared, and whatever is in here remains. It's the same thing. And now that times the derivative of that eventually culminates to this final term. Okay, so now once you have a, uh, s a ensemble of um, nuclei, uh, atoms, then now within our approximations we know how to calculate the total energy, and I also calculate the atom on the force on a, uh, on a nucleus due to the presence of another one. Now what one is additionally interested in often is to take this ensemble and make sure that it's in equilibrium, so that the nuclei, when you let them go, they remain where they are, or they move to a location where they remain afterwards stationary. And that is the description of equilibrium, and that for that purpose, what we need to make sure is that the force that every nucleus experiences is zero, okay? So the force on atom i is to sum of all the forces that it experiences due to the presence of the other atoms, right? So sum over j is not equal to i, so that is equal to, it's something that we can calculate from that expression, j is not equal to i, del phi over del r uh, i, right? Or r i j, which I have calculated, okay? So that would be the total force on nucleus I and it should vanish. Okay? So what you can do in a clever numerical, uh, numerical uh, procedure is to place the uh, nuclei at reasonable locations through some dedicated, some reasonable experience-based gaze if you like and then move them around so that the atoms sit in locations where they experience no force. That's sometimes called relaxing, okay, because initially the energy is probably going to be high, okay, because they are not at equilibrium position, and then they relax towards locations where each nucleus experiences zero force, and equilibrium is associated with decreasing energy, so the energy is relaxed, and when the atoms, each one is at its equilibrium position, the overall energy of the system should be at a minimum, okay? So you relax the energy from some non-equilibrium position to an equilibrium position, okay? 
Okay, so let's keep those in mind, all right? So what was our purpose? Our purpose was to eventually make a transition to the continuum, the macroscopic scale from this atomic or microscopic scale. And now that we have a good uh, part of the puzzle at our hands, let's proceed with the description of the puzzle itself, okay? And um, I, think, I think we will be surprised at how, after so much discussion that started from sort of from quantum mechanics, um, how we will end up with a strain energy in such a smooth fashion. I think it will be nice. So let's invoke something that's called the Cauchy-Born hypothesis. So I'm going to draw the picture that I usually draw. We have, in fact, I didn't like it, so let me draw it once again. Okay. We have our reference configuration, R0, um, and our current configuration, R. Uh, this is what I'm going to call the macro or the continuum scale. Um, we are at a certain point. And at that point, right, uh, remember where the description of the deformation gradient comes from. Of course, there is uh, some motion, okay? And that motion is eventually what is going to give rise to the deformation gradient. But the deformation gradient, also remember, is what takes an infinitesimal line element, D capital X, and maps it to an infinitesimal line element on the current configuration. And specifically, DX is F D capital X. Now, that's a critical piece of uh, information that we should um, recall. All right, now good, so far nothing new, but now I realize that this material that I assume to so far have a continuous, a smeared out structure, actually is not such a structure. When you look closely into it, you see that it will have a certain structure. And let us assume that this structure is one that is very specific. In fact, it has, let's say, a crystal structure. Okay. Um, so, I zoom in and I see a, I'm looking at a piece of it at the micro or in this case the atomic scale. And what I see are atoms that it's an idealized scenario and a very simple scenario. Clearly, the atoms are arranged in a nice periodic fashion. And just to guide us, I'm going to also draw here some lines. Okay. Um, so let's imagine this nice cube of the um, piece that I've taken. Let's call it the referential configuration of a piece from the crystal C0. Okay, C referring to crystal and uh, not referring to the reference configuration. And the initial volume is capital V. Okay. Now, of course, here every atom has a certain location. For instance, this one is at Ri. I'm using a capital R because it's a reference configuration. Uh, this one is at RJ, and the vector that points from RI to RI to J is capital RIJ, okay? Again, following our definitions. Now, um, once you stop writing, please, Give me your attention for a few minutes. <laughs> 
Now, first of all, I'm assuming uh, that whatever, I structure, whatever structure I have here, it's relaxed. So this thing is in equilibrium. Okay? How do I find it out? I've just discussed it. You throw in the nuclei, move them around until every nucleus experiences zero force. Okay. Uh, so then I know this configuration. Well, now, however, the macro scale is subject to some deformation. And that deformation microscopically entails the deformation of this crystal. So at every point, there is something going on. And microscopically, that accounts into this, let's say, wire mesh deforming in some manner. But the wire mesh is just a guide. What's really happening is, after deformation, after distortion of this crystal, the nuclei should be at locations that are, again, um, equilibrium positions. Okay? Now, that is, in general, let's say reality over here, is not something that is easy to calculate. So in reality, when I look at the new configuration of this cell, and now I'm making up, I'm exaggerating actually, because when you have such a nice structure, the deformation will most likely be nice as well. But in reality, remember that these blue atoms are not the only atoms I might have around. Uh, what I might have is I might have one type of atom there as well. I might have yet another atom there. And this might be a repeating structure, so I will have such atoms over here and here and here, there, there as well, and so on. So in other words, the unit cells, the repeating cells that I'm describing to construct the crystal is not necessarily a simple unit cell. I'm drawing it to be simple, but it's just a schematic of a possible complexity. Okay? So when you have such a complex crystal, in general, when it deforms, the nuclei move into such locations that are not easily describable uh, analytically, but you can always compute. And suppose after you compute, they look like this. One nucleus moves over here, the other one moves over there, one moves there. Again, I'm exaggerating. Okay. okay. And those extra atoms, some of them move there, some of them move there. So it's not a simple deformation, but is it something one can calculate? In principle, one can. Again, you have to somehow distort this crystal. And after the distortion, you need to make sure that the nuclei are, again, at zero force locations, equilibrium locations. But it's going to be tough to make a calculation like that based on what we have described will require some sort of a molecular dynamic simulation. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is to have a very simple uh, and smooth transition from the atomic to continuum scale. And for that purpose, we need to make further approximation. And our approximation is going to be one that is sometimes quite meaningful, but in general, one that is a approximation, as the name suggests. And the approximation is based on that map. I think to myself, well, OK, if I have an infinitesimal line element on the reference configuration, it's simply mapped to the current one through the deformation gradient. Why don't I assume the same thing for these relative position vectors? In other words, why don't I say that the relative position vector upon deformation is mapped or related to the relative position vector on the reference configuration in exactly the same way? Now, that's not necessarily true, because if it were so, it means that for every pair i and j that you take, this is the map. In general, for this pair, the map might be accurate. But for the other pair, the map might be wrong because the atoms move, in general, uh, into positions that are not easily predictable by at least such an approximation. So that is the so-called cauchy born hypothesis. So, well, what do I then see if I make that approximation? Well, every line is simply stretched and rotated because that's what F is. Let's say we have the right polar decomposition RU, right? Rotate, rotated and stretched. So this was initially a boxed box. Upon deformation, I'm going to again see a box, okay? But one that is distorted as such. 
So let's call that C, the current configuration of the piece of crystal I'm looking at. And it's going to have a new volume V, I'm going to make use of all of that, which is simply J times capital V. So because this is like infinitesimal volume dV, infinitesimal volume d capital V, and they're mapped to each other through the determinant of deformation. Okay? So those are all pieces of information that I have. And finally, I have my guidelines. These guidelines are going to, again, be mapped nicely. And the nuclei are going to sit right at the intersection points. And this is now Ri, that is Rj, and this here is Rij. Okay. And through the cauchy born hypothesis, I know exactly what it is, right? So the cauchy born hypothesis entails or ap approximates the deformation to be uniform. It applies in the same manner to every nucleus in the crystal. Uniform lattice deformation. And one also sometimes verbally puts it as uh, the macroscopic deformation gradient. Is projected uniformly onto the microscale. Okay. Again, I like to highlight macro, micro, they don't refer to absolute length scale. It's just a relative, uh, relative terminology. Okay? Micro is much less than macro. In this case, micro is atomic, macro is continuum. So eventually, if you really want to proceed with an approximation, with such an approximation, notice that you may still need to do some let's say molecular dynamics once, but you do that only at the beginning and only once, just to determine C0. And that's the initial overhead cost, but once you do it, then subsequently you can extract the equilibrium locations of the atoms, and you can proceed with any sort of macroscopic analysis in some sense, and for any given deformation on the macroscale at any given point, you know precisely the location at the microscale through this assumption based on the initial configuration of the lattice that you, um, that you uh, calculate at the beginning. All right? So now that's also nice. So we introduce yet another hypothesis. Now let us, in just a few minutes, um, see how this final approximation finally allows us to make a smooth transition to the macro scale. And it's just a couple of lines. Okay, so let's finish it. Okay, so have a look here for a second. Let's do it together because it's so short. Um, I'm trying to calculate the total energy of the system, right? Um, and that's equal to one half sum over I equals one to, or let's forget the number of nuclei, uh, sum over I and sum over J not equal to I, phi tilde, um, and the magnitude of R I J. Now I'm writing that explicitly because now I have some critical piece of information from the cauchy born hypothesis, which says that this Rij is actually the deformation gradient on the macro scale at that point, capital Rij. And this is something I assume I know. Either I do the molecular dynamics myself, or somebody tells me what the initial equilibrium coordinates are. But once I do that, for a given f, I know, therefore, what E is. Now, therefore, E can be calculated given Rij for any given f, and therefore E is some function, let's call it E hat of the deformation gradient implicitly, okay? Um, so now, having observed that, now I can also go ahead
calculate the energy per unit volume of the crystal, okay? So I'm smearing out in some sense, and therefore this is sort of a continuum thing, and I'm smearing out, smearing out the energy two per, two per, in terms of per unit volume. Uh, there is no energy at a point at a given location in the crystal. There is no such thing, but I'm smearing it out anyway, following continuum thinking, and that simply says, okay, so let's write that smear out the energy. That simply says that I take the total energy, E tilde E hat, which is a function of the deformation gradient, and divide it by the volume. Now, which volume? It's your choice, but I'm going to pick the referential one because um, that, if I do that, I can now understand this to be the strain energy function, which was defined to be the energy per unit volume of the reference configuration, okay? So therefore, since this is a function of F, this is now a function of F. And therefore, I have in a very simple manner obtained the macroscopic strain energy function. And I have, in fact, even a explicit form for it because I know what phi tilde is, Leonard Jones potential, let's say. It has an explicit, de explicit dependence on the distance, which I know, it's in the description of Leonard Jones. Now, in place of that, I'm plugging in this, and therefore I have, after the sum, which is a bit tricky, and that's what we're going to deal with next time, I have an explicit dependence on F, and I just scale by V, there you go an explicit functional form for the macroscopic strain energy function. Now, and finally, once you have the strain energy function, you might ask yourself, well, when I move the atoms with respect to one another, one another I strain the crystal, and each atom will now experience some sort of force, okay? Um, now, on the macroscopic level, I think not in terms of forces, but in terms of stress, and therefore the fact that when I, do, when I deform, the energy is changing should somehow relate to an expression for the stressing of the crystal. And so what is the stress? Well, we've already covered mechanics at large deformations, hyperelasticity. It's something we can easily extract from W. It's nothing but well, first of all, it is a function of the deformation gra gradient as well, but it's nothing but the derivative of W with respect to F, okay? Or, if you want to calculate the second pillar Kirchhoff stress, you would take the derivative of W with respect to E. W is in terms of F, so you can also take its derivative with respect to E if you like. So, but that's what I'm going to stick to in this part of the lecture. It's easier, I'm going to follow the route that is easier for our purposes, okay? But that's nice, we're essentially done. So, uh, of course, there are the details to tackle uh, which are remaining, but presently we've come a long way. Starting the, with the quantum mechanics description, what I've described you is a way to find out the stress that occurs in a crystal for a given macroscopic deformation in very rigorous terms, okay, through the theoretically, uh, theoretically described strain energy function. Okay. I think that's remarkable. Okay. All right, so next time we proceed with the details. Any questions before we wrap this part up? All right, okay, see you next time.